I've been a law professor for 31 years at the Benjamin N. Cardozo School of Law here in uh, New York City. And uh, when DNA testing uh, began to get transferred from medical and research uses to the forensic arena, uh, my colleague Peter Neufeld and I uh, became very conversant with it um, in 1988, 1989. Um, in fact, we tried to get somebody out of prison who'd been convicted uh, by our old, in, in the Bronx, um, represented by the public defender's office where we used to work. Um, and we tried to do DNA testing before it was even in the courts to prove that he was innocent. He had been convicted of a rape, and there were 17 alibi witnesses that he had at a prayer meeting. But there were three eyewitnesses, so he was convicted, notwithstanding um, what appeared to be strong proof of his innocence. And we tried to do DNA testing. Uh, with a new private company named Life Codes, but we couldn't get any results. Uh, and instead, we were able to prove him innocent with uh, other kinds of evidence. Uh, but at that time, uh, everybody recognized that DNA was going to be very important. And uh, Governor Mario Cuomo, in his last, uh, one of his last acts of his administration, uh, set up a commission to look at uh, DNA testing. Um, and how it might affect the criminal justice system. Now, we're talking 1988, 1989. Uh, and Peter and I were on that commission, and we met a number of uh, scientists, uh, particularly uh, Dr. Jan Witkowski from Cold Spring Harbor. And he, in turn, introduced us uh, to a number of scientists, uh, uh, in particular Dr. Eric Lander, uh, who was then part of the Whitehead Institute, MIT and Harvard and now is uh, one of President Obama's science advisors, uh, one of two or three science advisors. And uh, he's at the Broad Institute. He was both a geneticist and a mathematician and a very, very brilliant guy. Um, and so he taught us a lot, <laughs> not just about uh, uh, molecular biology, but also about how science works, technology transfers, and the interplay between scientific institutions, science, and uh, governmental institutions. And uh, it was sort of left to us to figure out uh, how this would work within the court system. Uh, so uh, from the very beginning of learning about this technology, uh, the truth is uh, um, we knew it would be transformative. Uh, we knew that it would have an enormous impact, uh, uh, not just in exonerating people who were wrongfully convicted, but apprehending people um, who really had committed the crimes. And uh, just uh, a learning moment. Uh, so that we could figure out uh, uh, what causes wrongful convictions and how to prevent them. We do get uh, uh, hundreds of letters per week, and we have still a queue, a waiting list of uh, a few thousand people. But our criteria is very simple. For our project, the point is, uh, if a DNA test could in and of itself prove you innocent, and uh, the way things work now, more than one DNA test, uh, because when uh, this technology was first transferred to the forensic arena, uh, we were doing what they were known as uh, restriction fragment length polymorphism tests. People would know those as the bands, right? Uh, and that was looking at nuclear DNA. That would be a, 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 a cell that has a nucleus, and you extract the DNA from the nucleus of the cell. Uh, now, we have techniques using what's known as polymerase chain reaction, and this is, uh, or PCR, and the best way to think about this, it's molecular Xeroxing. You can take a very, very small amount of starting material and amplify it up, and you can look not just at nuclear DNA, and uh, the technique that's now known is called short tandem repeats. So there's, uh, uh, using these so-called STRs, or short tandem repeats, there is now a, uh, a set of markers that are used for the database here in the United States. Um, and they're also used in the United Kingdom and all over the world, frankly. So we have one, developing one huge DNA database just based on this one particular short tandem repeat system. Um, but now we can also do what's known as Y DNA testing, which is just looking at uh, DNA from the Y chromosome. And you can amplify that up with the PCR. And then there's another technique called mitochondrial DNA testing. Mitochondrial DNA is a DNA test that uh, literally uh, looks at the mitochondrial uh, 
a mitochondria within a cell. It's sort of the powerhouse of a cell, and that's maternally inherited. So your mitochondrial DNA is the same as uh, uh, your mom's and your brothers or sisters, um, uh, unless something really weird is going on in your family. <laughs> many, many different kinds of DNA tests have developed uh, since we first came into business about uh, 15 years ago, and uh, that has enhanced uh, our capability of answering the simple question that you asked me is how can we, how do we decide to take a case? And the simple answer is, well, if DNA can prove you innocent, but now we can do lots of different DNA tests and uh, the methods of extraction have gotten much better. Uh, so uh, it's a misnomer. People talk about touch DNA. That's really uh, not helpful. But uh, what, what is really meant there is that you can extract DNA from epithelial or skin cells, for example, that might be found on a piece of clothing or uh, if the uh, assailant, let's say, left uh, uh, a sneaker uh, or any kind of, or a, 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 a woolen hat or something where you might find saliva or skin cells or any piece of clothing, you can now uh, take cuttings from various different parts of that clothing and develop a DNA profile of the quote unquote usual wearer. So all these different techniques, <clears throat> when combined together, and when you get redundancy of results, uh, uh, can greatly assist in uh, demonstrating that somebody didn't commit the crime, uh, uh, even when you're looking at cases that are 10, 15, 20, 30 years old.